Good morning. <coughs> we are going to discuss today this CMOS inverter with the technology of CMOS we have already introduced. But then let us see slightly in more detail the CMOS inverter. All right. As you already know that this is the basic CMOS inverter cell. And as per the N-well technology, which we have discussed earlier, N-well technology. So this is the N-well. You remember that all the N-MOSs, this is N-MOS and this is P-MOS. This is N-MOS and this is P-MOS. All NMOSs are developed on the substrate or on the IP layer, whatever the case may be. <coughs> All NMOSs are developed on the substrate or the IP layer. P it is, it is a, remember, it is a P IP layer on P plus substrate. Whereas all the PMOSs are to be developed into on the N wells, N type tabs. That's called, that is what is known as in well CMOS technology, okay? The symbol for the PMOS and NMOS, there are varieties, but let me, let, this is the one which is very popular, but other symbols, I think you know that uh, this is something like this. This is drain, this is source, and this is gate. And we put an arrow here, and the direction of the arrow indicates whether it is NMOS or PMOS. If it is NMOS, the substrate is P, and as a result, the source substrate junction is a PN junction, and the normal nomenclature is this. So if the arrow direction is this, we call it NMOS. On the other hand, the other thing is, this was the old nomenclature, of course. Drain, source, and get. If the arrow in the opposite direction, it is in substrate, so the diode direction is this. The PN diode direction of the source substrate junction is this, and this indicates PMOS. Okay, so you can draw like this, but you know, drawing such symbolically, you know, in the repeated circuit diagram drawing, it is difficult. Therefore, nowadays we prefer to use this kind of thing, where we don't put an arrow and there is a continuous line. Only thing there is a gap to show that is a field effect transistor, MOSFET, not field MOSFET, metal oxide field effect semiconductor field effect transistor, and if this gap is not there, it is a JFET. That is you know, standard thing. If the gap is not there, it is JFET. But if there is a gap, it is a MOSFET. If it is drawn simply like this, it is in MOS. On the other hand, if you put a small dot here, a circle here, then becomes PMOS. If this, this is what is known, it is a channel of this, this is nothing but the channel of the MOSFET. If there are two lines in the channel, it indicates the channel is already on. It is a depletion mode device. But if there is a single line, it means the channel is off normally, and therefore it is an enhancement mode device. So please note 
that CMOS is usually constructed using an NMOS and PMOS. Both are enhancement mode devices. Please remember, none of them is depletion mode. But thereafter, some people have suggested some innovative structures, etc. They have remained only in this state. So forget about that. It's today, till today, commercially, what CMOS means is combination of two MOSFETs, one PMOSFET, the other NMOSFET, both are enhancement mode. In NWL technology, all the driver transistors are NMOSs. Please note. In NWL technology, all driver transistors are NMOSs and they are built on the substrate or AP layer. Please refer to the NMOS cross, the CMOS cross section which has been discussed in the class earlier. And remember that NMOS was shown, was developed on the P type substrate or the P AP layer. Whereas all the PMOSs are built on the N wells or N type diffuse tabs. All right? So, this is the, in brief, the basic description of a CMOS inverter. And as you know, that we can develop any CMOS logic, static logic, by, you know, make it judicious, by making a judicious uh, uh, paralleling and in a judicious way, paralleling and series combining the devices. I think you know that if you want to realize a OR gate, what is NOR gate, what you have to do? You connect the driver transistors in parallel and the load transistors in series. On the other hand, for realizing a NAND gate, you connect the driver transistors in series and load transistors in parallel. And that's the usual thing for the static CMOS logic. So we shall be discussing that in detail after that. Now, if you look at this structure, you see that the if we consider the NMOS, its VGS N is nothing but VI. All right? And its VDS is nothing but VO. So this is for the NMOS. On the other hand, for the PMOS, VGS P is nothing but, what is VGS P? You see that I have shorted the substrate with this terminal, the so-called VDD terminal of PMOS. So this is basically the source side of the PMOS and this is the drain side of the PMOS. This is the source side of the NMOS, this is the drain side of the NMOS. Okay? So you see that two sources are located, one in the ground side for the NMOS, the other in the power supply side for the PMOS. Okay? So what is VGS for the P-channel PMOS is simply equal to VI minus VDD, am I correct? And what is the VDS for the PMOS? Again, it is VO minus VDD. So this should be kept in mind. All right? Now, if you want to draw, if you now draw the output characteristics of the driver transistor, so I am Plotting this is ID for the driver and this is the VDS for the driver. Then the characteristic of this simply something like this, as you already know, it will be a set of characteristics like this. Etc. And now showing up to the breakdown. Breakdown will occur still at a higher bias. So this will be the characteristics of the driver in MOS transistor. For different values of VGS means VI. So I should indicate like this. This is for different values of VGS N. 
which is nothing but Vi for different. This is for threshold voltage, next higher voltage, next higher voltage, and positively higher and higher. Similarly, suppose this is the VDD point. This is the VDD point on the characteristic on the axis. Sir. Then I can draw the I can draw the characteristics of the PMOS, the load transistor on the same graph. Only thing you noting that the VDSP is nothing but VO minus VDD. So what is, suppose this is VO, this point is a typical VO. Then VO minus VDD means you have to go in the other side. So if I now try to draw the corresponding characteristics for the load transistor, IV characteristics. Then this is this axis is for ID for the load. In this case, actually N. D means N and L means P. Please remember that. N MOS and P MOS. Then what will be the kind of different characteristics? It will be simply like this. This is for the corresponding different values of VGSP. And what is VGSP? Is VI minus VDD. So if this blue curve, this blue curve, this particular blue curve is for, say, VT is equal to, say, let us assume that VTN is 1 volt and VTP is also minus 1 volt because P MOS and N MOS it will be plus and minus naturally. Both are enhancement mode. You expected that if VTN is 1 volt, VTP will be something negative. But we are assuming that we are the same in magnitude. Magnitude of VTN and magnitude of VTP the same. <coughs> Threshold voltage are the same. So if this blue line, this particular blue line, is for a typical, say, VGSN, which is, means nothing but VI for, say, 3 volt. And if our VDD is 5 volt, then what will be the corresponding blue curve, some, this one or that one, depending, of course, the you know, geometry, etc. Say, so what may be the corresponding this curve? When VI is 3 volt, what is the corresponding VGSP? Minus 2 volt. So I am perhaps here. This may be the characteristic for that, or this may be that. So this may be, sorry, this this particular curve may be for the corresponding VGSP, which is equal to, in this particular case, minus 2 volt. This is for minus 1 volt. Minus 1 volt is the threshold voltage for the P channel. Therefore, this curve, I think you understood why the two curves are going oppositely. Am I correct? Or is, it, is it clearly understood? Now, you remember that while discussing the NELS inverter, I do the set of output characteristics of the driver transistor. And then I do a load line, which is contributed by the load transistor. And that was a fixed load line. That load line was not a variable load line, a constant load line. Only thing is that load line was non-linear in spite of, in, instead of linear. Normal resistive load, the load line is a linear line like this, straight line like this. Whereas for the active load, the load line is non-linear because it is basically a non-linear resistor. The load is a non-linear resistor. But in this case, do you think that there will be just one constatic load line for the CMOS cell? 
you see that in the last examples of any ls any lt and any para ld you can call it this was the gate voltage was a fixed voltage either it was clamped to vdd or it was clamped to a certain fixed vgg or it was clamped to the output point depending on whether it is a saturated load a linear load or a depletion load you remember that but anyway, our VGS was fixed for the load. But in this case, do you think that VGS is VGS for the, uh, the PMOS is fixed? No, because here both the gates are connected to the input. A common node is formed by connecting the both the gates, and this is the input. <coughs> so as input changes, the gate voltage of this one is also changing. The gate voltage of this MOSFET is changing. Therefore, the load line is also changing. When VI is equal to 0 volt, this one is, what is the corresponding value of VDS for this transistor? Minus 5. It is strongly in saturation region. And what was the corresponding input voltage for this gate, for this transistor, was also minus 5. So this may be the curve, this particular curve, this may be this curve. On the other hand, when VI is 5 volt, other side, one is VI is equal to 0, then VI is 5 volt, then what is happening? This voltage is, this gate voltage is 0, so it is below the threshold voltage. So the corresponding load characteristic is this one. Corresponding load line is nothing but coincident with the abscissa. Whereas the corresponding driver characteristic may be this one. Or this one depends. You see that as the input voltage is changing, the load line is swinging from one characteristic to next character is continuous variable load line case. That's the basic difference between the CMOS inverter and the other kind of inverter, single channel inverter, which we have discussed earlier. In the case of single channel inverter, the load line or the fixed load line which was not dependent on input, input voltage. But in this case, the load line itself varies as the input voltage swings. And what will be the output voltage? How do you get the output voltage and co corresponding current? From the intersection of the two. Am I correct? From the intersection of the two. So for example, I may have a situation this. This is the intersection of this one and this one, as I was telling you at that time. Or you may get a situation like this. So what will happen as a result? As you are moving from, as input voltage is moving from 0 volt to 5 volt, how the point of intersection of the output characteristics and the load line is shifting? Can you tell me now? Say so find VI is equal to 0. What is the output characteristic? This one. And what is the corresponding load line? This one. Because this is for say maximum, maybe it is for minus 5 volt VGSP. <coughs> VGSP. So what is the point of intersection at this point? You are starting from here. So it is expected when VI is equal to 0, the output voltage this transistor is off. So the output voltage should be VDD because the capacitor here will be charged to the full voltage VDD. This is very heavily on. This is very heavily on. So it will be charged to the full voltage VDD. So I, the, I am st starting at, at this point. Now suppose I now come to VTN is equal to input is 1 volt. Input is 1 volt. Where I am now? Still this is the characteristic for the output transistor or the load driver transistor, and so I am still here. But now as I go to VTN, VI is equal to 2 volt, which is perhaps this characteristic, which is perhaps this, this is for maybe for VI is equal to 2 volt. This, this is the, for VI is equal to 2 volt, all right? 
up to 1 volt, this is the characteristic. But VI is equal to 2 volt, this is the output, the driver characteristic. And what is the corresponding load, load line? Maybe this one. So where I am now? I am somewhere here. I am here. So initially I was here, then I have gone to this point. Then as we make it VI is equal to 3 volt, where I am? This is the characteristic. All right? And what is the corresponding output characteristic? Maybe this one. So I am here. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. And first point was this, second point was this, third point. This is wrongly put. This is the third point. Okay? Then when VI is equal to somewhere that it is understood, then perhaps I may come to a point which is this one. Like this, as you, what will happen, this point will gradually move from this side. And then when VDD is equal to 5 volt, what is happening? VI is equal to 5 volt, what is happening? Then this characteristic is this one. The output driver characteristic is this one, but the load line is this. So, I have, so there will be a movement of this point of intersection like this. The points, therefore, and this is nothing but your VDD, VD, VDS means your uh, nothing but VO. This is nothing but VD, here VDSD is nothing but VO. So you see that as input voltage is changing, VO will swing like this. It will start from zero volt, so the highest level, VDD. Then it will gradually drop down because VDD, VO is falling and ultimately it will fall to zero volt. Am I correct? And you can now draw this typical characteristic like this. This is your now VO versus VI of the CMOS inverter. So we expect to get a curve something like this. And this is the point I am saying this point is nothing but I can call it VTN, N MOS threshold voltage. And somewhere here perhaps is the point, this one is VTP. All right, so you can say that the two transistors, the two transistors, one is NMOS and PMOS, they are working in complementary fashion. When one is going from to saturation, the other is going to linear region. When, is, <coughs> when, it is one, when the driver is passing from saturation to linear, this one is just going in the opposite direction. They are working in complementary fashion. In the steady state, in the steady state, the current is practically zero. Because one of the transistor is always off. Either this one is off or this, sorry, sorry. Either this transistor is off or this transistor is off. When this is off, the current, the steady state current is zero. But the steady state load current is zero. It is a capacitive load. Similarly, when this is off, this current is also zero. So we say that CMOS is characterized by a practically zero power dissipation in the steady state. So when you are not when you are not applying the clock, when the logic is on, the circuit is on, but we are not applying any swing, that means any clock input to the logic, any data input to the logic, it should not draw much power. Practically it should not draw any power because the CMOS technology, the current is maybe in modern technology, it may be in the range of even piquet towards piquet amperes, nano amperes to piquet amperes. Practically, it will not draw any current. But whatever current it will draw, that is during the intermediate thing. 
when I am at this point. Sorry. When I am at this point, somewhere here, when both the transistors are on, and therefore there will be a lot of power dissipation. So whatever power dissipation that will take place in the MOSFET, in the CMOS inverter, that will be during the transient, that is during the transfer phase from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. But in the steady state, there should not be practically any power dissipation. And how to generate this curve? Simply by noting down the point of intersection of the dynamic load line with the static characteristics and transferring them here. And you get the corresponding characteristic. And you can get the same thing mathematically in the same way as we did earlier. You can write down the current equation for the MOS and NMOS and PMOS under the various condition one is on, the other is off, but you know that both the transistors will go through the two phases, linear and saturation. You can easily find out that which region, depending on the uh, threshold voltage, etc., and we can easily find out when the transistor is, uh, you know, the pair, how they are behaving, and corresponding current equations can be written, and it can be solved, and you can get that mathematically, you can mathematically get an expression relating VO and PI. Graphically, you can do so simply by graphical means, as I've just indicated. You draw the characteristics, and graphically also you can extract this particular thing. Now let us see one very interesting thing. So when I'm at this point, say, I'm calling at this point, at this point, you see that suppose this is your VTN, and I have indicated this is your VTP. I think you understood why this one is VTP. Up to this point, I have indicated the output voltage is zero. Is it all right to all of you? Huh? This is VTP and this one is VTN. Please remember that. This one is VTN. And VTN and VTP may be equal or may not be equal. Let us see whether they should be equal, etc. Those things we shall see now. And From here to here, when I am here at this point, when VO is this much, it is fairly above VTN. Similarly, it is fairly below the corresponding point. And at this point, most probably you can easily find from this, at the intermediate point, somewhere here maybe, both the transistors are saturated. This one and that one, both are saturated. So what I should do now to obtain this point, what I should do now? I should write down the current equation for the PMOS and NMOS in saturation and equate them. Let us do that. If you do that, that means you equate IDN with IDP. <coughs> Both transistors in saturation. <coughs> and you know the expression. Equate them, write down the current equation and equate them. And you find the final you will get by doing so a very interesting expression, which is this. <coughs> Where, so I have got it by from this, by doing this, where VI asterisk is the normalized input voltage, VDD also is equal to VIH or VOH, VP is equal to VPP 
magnitude divided by VDD and VN is equal to VTN magnitude divided by VDD. So all voltages VI, VP, VN, VI is the input voltage normalized by VDD. VP is the threshold voltage of the P-channel device magnitude normalized by VDD and VN is a threshold voltage of the N channel device normal magnitude by VDD. You can very easily get, you remember that when in saturation, uh, the, it is actually VGS beta into beta by two into VGS minus VT whole square. So from that formula we get this equation. And from here, you find that you get an expression for VI so let me write here itself, VI is equal to VDD into root over beta R into 1 minus VP plus VN divided by 1 plus root over beta R. Where again beta R is, beta R is beta n by beta p. Instead of writing now load and driver, I am writing beta n means it is driver transistor n MOS. That is why instead of beta d, I have written beta n. And this is similarly, instead of beta l, I have written beta p. So you see that I get an expression for vi in terms of, there is no view here. Have you, not, have you noted? Have you noted that in this expression there is no VO? So what is the conclusion from this? I mean, if there is a situation when both the transistors are saturated, then input voltage is independent of output voltage. That means we are in a vertical region you see that over this vertical region, midway between the low state and high state, the output voltage is, input voltage is constant. Though output voltage is varying, input voltage is constant. And that one is this, is, this is that input voltage. So what, did, what does it show? It shows that the transition gain dVO by dVI of the CMOS at the midpoint of the transfer characteristic is very, very high. Infinity, ideally. The transition gain dVO by dVI at the midpoint of the midpoint or halfway, I should not write exact midpoint, that I'm coming to that whether it should be midpoint or not, that we shall decide just now. But halfway, somewhere halfway between the low state and half state, somewhere intermediate, where the transition slope takes place, maximum slope occurs, the output voltage varies, but input voltage does not vary. That means the corresponding transition gain is very high. So what is, my conclu what is the conclusion out of this statement? You don't have to bother much about the beta ratio. In fact, it is true for any beta. It is independent you know, for any beta, any value of beta r. This is, this is true. This expression shows that vi is independent of u. And that is valid for any value of beta r. So there is no need to bother about that high beta ratio to be maintained, which was very much necessary in all the other configurations which have been discussed earlier. Am I correct? Whatever other inverter configurations I have discussed so far, there we have seen that there is a need for maintaining a large value of beta r. Of course, for the depletion mode load, the beta r requirement was not that high, but still I had to maintain around five. Beta r was necessary that it has to be maintained to have a value of five. In NELS and NELT, it was just around 50, it's very high. 
And in the other case, it is phi. But in this case, we don't bother about beta r. Let us now see. Suppose we make beta r is equal to 1. Suppose we make beta r is equal to 1. Beta r1 one means beta n is equal to beta p. Then what is, and also if I assume that vp is equal to vn, that means the threshold voltages are the same. The magnitude of threshold voltages of the two MOSFETs are the same. Then what is vi? What is vi? VDD by 2. <coughs> Is it a very interesting piece of information for you? So if I design my CMOS in such a way that the two threshold voltage are identical, they are same in magnitude, and beta R is 1, then this point is exactly meet at the center of the swing, and which is most desirable. In that case, we'll get the same order of noise margins for the low and high state. This will lead to NM0 is equal to NM1. This fact will lead to NM0 is equal to NM1. What does it, what, so what is your um, you know, advantage? Advantage is, you see that I have maintained beta r is equal to 1, packing density point to a lot of advantage. I don't have to maintain a large beta ratio. And only problem I have just invited, and what is that? I have assumed that beta Vn is equal to Vp, that means Vtn is equal to Vtp. Do you think it is an easy thing? Two MOSFETs, I have to maintain that their threshold voltage is the same. So that has to be done by the so-called channel implantation technique. I have just mentioned that. You have to control the channel implantation of the N MOSs and P MOSs such that they have to be carried out independently, such that the two threshold voltages are, same, are the same in magnitude. Then we get an ideal antisymmetric characteristic around the center point of the logic swing and so far as logic levels and noise margins are concerned, this will be the most optimum, it will be the optimum. And that's a great advantage for CMOS. And if I have to maintain, but what is my beta P and beta, you remember the beta P is some constant multiplied by mu P and W by L P. You see that that mu is there. If you remember the expression for beta, there is some COX, et cetera, and then there is mu, the channel mobility. And similarly, beta n is some constant <coughs> into mu n, same constant, into W by L of n. Therefore, if beta p if beta r is equal to 1, that means beta p is equal to beta n. Then you see that w beta, sorry, if beta r is equal to 1, then w by l of n driver divided by w by l <coughs> of load should be how much? Mu P approximately very interesting observation. You see that in earlier cases I have to maintain this was my beta ratio, in fact. The W by L ratio was my beta ratio. And that was much higher than one unity. But now I have to make even little bit, let us see that the driver transistor little bit smaller in size compared to the load transistor. Can you tell me why physically? This is a very, very important fact about CMOS. 
why physically why this is so what has to be done basically you have to have similar conductance of the two devices in order that they are identical in nature but they behave oppositely is a push pull type of operation cmos is a push pull type of operation therefore electrically they should be identical but behaving oppositely and for that what is needed we need that the channel conductance should be the same for similar conditions and the channel conductance is proportional not only to the geometrical factor w by l but also the mobility if the higher there is higher mobility i can manage it still smaller geometry and that's why you have to maintain so this is a very nice piece of information for cmos so if i now round up my discussion about cmos inverter so far as the dc levels are concerned what i want to what i should say what 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 should be the conclusions about this cmos inverter compared to the single channel inverters can you name one by one no. can you tell us tell me one by one what are the first one very 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 low power so not only low power extremely low power and that is the most important aspect of cmos that is the most important aspect of cmos why is low power is giving so much importance but in that case i can have a very very complex circuit on a single chip consuming reasonable power same order of complex circuit if i want to integrate realize using either nmos or bipolar technology it will perhaps consume hundreds of watt and hundreds of watt cannot be maintained in a single chip of 5 mm by 5 mm on the other hand in this case it may be perhaps managed with a few watts for the whole uh, you know that that 10 to the power 6 transistor circuit it depends because we are not assuming that all the transistors will be simultaneously on and off some of them will really take part in the logic operations therefore average power consumption during the operation of the logic will be quite small though the transistor circuit is very very complex so please remember this first point is that very very low power consumption second point <coughs> i can say it is Now, unfortunately, that is not so. This is not the packing density. How how do you conclude that? Because in CMOS compared to NMOS, you know, you have to provide N wells for isolating PMOS from NMOS. And not only that, to inhibit the latch up effect. Usually, I have to provide very good isolation surrounding the N wells, and that will eat away. appreciable amount of space so it is not true that cmos has got a higher packing density compared to so so far as packing density is concerned nmos is superior or any single channel channel mos logic is superior to cmos so far as packing density is concerned all right third point hmm noise margin noise margin okay yeah for the same packing density for the same kind of packing density means uh, the same bit ratio very with a very low bit yeah you can tell me one thing i'm sorry yes uh, packing density point of view because w by l advantage is there in cmos you can say that that is why perhaps you told the packing density is high but you did not remember that n well structure so n well structure compensates for that thing at least so for, if you compare it h mos which uses the depletion mode load the packing density is not really that much so you can say that today's cmos technology and today's nmos may are comparable in mos with h mos they are comparable so far as packing density is concerned you are right third point somebody suggested noise margins yes noise margin but again we have not gone into the details <coughs> what is the shape etc that affects the noise margin <coughs> but definitely cmos for your information the cmos provides reasonably good noise margins and uh, it is quite acceptable and third point and this is the proper and this symmetric means um 
means what do you mean here? Input output characteristics for any other That is, comes from noise module, equal noise module, etc. That's, that's the DC, yeah. And it's, the speed point of view, do you, do you think this is any advantage? Those nodes, why, why? Why is this any advantage? Why do you think this is 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 any advantage? Now, but you know, if you infer the kind of change we made from NELS to NELT and then NELD, and now to CMOS, do you think that CMOS will be superior in speed to that or inferior? But compared to NELS, it will be superior. It should be superior. NELT? Inferior. NELD? <laughs> so, it is rather critical to control, but yeah, one thing which again you have all missed, that is the presence of N well. That being N well acts as a charge storage things. And it is found that this due to the presence of N well, the overall the capacitive effects, extra capacitive effects come, come in, which you normally ignore for normal thinking. But when you consider CMOS, you have to consider the extra isolation capacitance which it provides. And it is a large capacitance. NOL is quite big. So that capacitance comes in and that adds to the RC delay. So naturally, therefore, CMOS will be inferior to NMOS so far as speed is concerned. <coughs> then question is, that why then CMOS is advancing so well and almost completely substituted in MOS? Reason is technology advances, sub micron uh, miniaturization, rapid miniaturizations of LSI are integral circuits. It started with 5 micron geometry in the early days of LSI MOS, but now it has run into the region of submicron and even deep submicron, people say now. Not only submicron, people are calling it deep submicron. We are going below 0.5 micron, channel length, the minimum feature size, channel length is below 0.5 micron. So with the miniaturization, what happens? Suppose if the length is reduced by a factor x, all the dimensions, length dimension, length, width, etc. in what ratio the Kept the areas are diminishing, x square. So power consumption, capacitance, and all these things will fall by a factor of x square. And that ultimately, with miniaturization, ultimately it leads to a very, very, you know, uh, you know, advantage, very, very good advantages in terms of speed, power consumption, packing density, and so on and so forth. And today's CMOS technology, which offers you around 0.5 micron channel length, gives you a speed in a, by different other innovativeness. As I told you that we have to maintain a very small, you know, that CGD, which I told you earlier, CGD. We have to maintain very low contact resistances. These are because any contact resistance will lead to the RC delay. So by reducing the contact resistances, by reducing the overlap between the gate and source drains, and by doing some other technique, I think you have heard of it, not know, LDD, lightly doped drain. You know, the problem of the today's MOS technology is the drain is so, na so narrow, so shallow, not narrow, drain junction is so shallow that it suffers from early breakdown. Early breakdown. And therefore, what people are doing, they are putting it a lightly doped drain first, and then which is followed by a strongly doped drain. That is what is called LDD MOSFET, lightly doped drain MOSFET. And by that technology, it has now been possible to operate MOSFETs at higher voltages. That means if the breakdown voltage problem has been reduced to a great extent. So by doing a lot of innovativeness in technology and device devices also, People now have achieved CMOS, which operates at um, very high speed, intrinsically. Don't consider the of output side, intrinsically. And CMOS is working at a, with a propagation delay of 100 picosecond is, is quite often 
spoken of. And whatever new chips you are guys nowadays encountering, I mentioned about the most advanced Pentium chip operating at around 180 megahertz clock rate is a result of tremendous advances in CMOS technology, where one chip contains millions of MOSFETs, million or border, border to one million, millions of MOSFETs, two, three millions in certain cases, near one million in certain other cases, and doing very complex function, and all these are done at a very low power and at a very high speed, which was unthinkable earlier. You know, the all mainframe computers Earlier, we were using ECL technology because of its very high speed. But ECL technology could not be made very, com very complex chips could not be realized in ECL. It draws a lot of power. Now, therefore, we are seeing the same cyber kind of computer, but on the table. You just see the same cyber type of computer. Cyber, what is the clock frequency of our cyber? A little bit higher than 100 megahertz. And you can get a Pentium or any advanced mic mini computer operating at more than 150 megahertz, and simply because of the CMOS. We shall discuss in the next class that how power dissipation is, um, you know, that in the in CMOS.